Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Are You There Ghost? It's me, Chiwan. I'm your host, Chiwan Choi. And today's special, special guest is someone I met in 2017 during our amazing 90 for 90 uh, festival. And she was one of our drunken masters. <laughs> uh, Jennifer Brody, aka Vera Strange. Is an award-winning author of more than 10 books. 10 books. I can't even imagine writing 10 books. So amazing. <laughs> including, yeah, Seven. including the 13th Continuum Trilogy. Uh, the Disney Chills series, which I'm super excited to talk to her about. And she was a Stoker finalist for Spectre Deep Six. Um, and she's just... Every time I look up on her social media, she's like, oh my God, I have another exciting announcement to make. I'm like, oh, damn. She's just on it. Um, her book's been translated to multiple languages all over the world. Um, she's been a film producer, TV producer and writer. Uh, she teaches creative writing and, you know, just all kinds of things. So please welcome. Jennifer Brody. Hi, Chiwan. It's so good to see you. I like to think I'm still a drunken master. <laughs> we're always, once a drunken master, I mean, I guess you could get sober, but once a drunken master, you're always a drunken master. That's not in my <laughs> pandemic survival plan. <laughs> no, no, I can't imagine. God bless you all out there who got sober during pandemic. No, no power I was, to you. No. <laughs> My brother's in Houston. He sent me this funny picture of the grocery store when everyone, you know, bought everything. And in Houston, everything was gone except the wine and the liquor. I was like, what's going on in Houston? <laughs> yeah, what? I that makes no sense. I don't understand. <laughs> I know. I love how it went from, you know, drinking by yourself at home is a really bad behavior and a sign you're an alcoholic to please drink by yourself at home. You're doing society a favor. You're very kind and right, generous right. to drink at home alone and watch television. I was yeah. Like, Like, we don't need to be out there, you know, spreading virus and drinking and then driving Just home. Go with Just your Trader Joe's wine. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for those of you out there listening, Drunken Masters is a event series we've done where we invite um, three writers of a specific genre uh, to come and get drunk and listen to uh, writers presenting their works in progress inside a bar, inside a bar with actual patrons of the bar. We used to do that, <laughs> didn't we? We used to, like, yeah. do things in real life. <laughs> yeah, and then they get live drunken feedback inside the bar in front of everyone. So that was amazing. That was fun times. Um, that seems so I long know, ago. I know, I miss that. It feels like a different world. We're in a sci-fi world now. I think I was on the sci-fi one. I was like, I write about it. I didn't want to live it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, we are living in a sci-fi time. I know we are. It's directed by John Carpenter, <laughs> who's it written right? Right. <laughs> We're about to be merged with like various different creatures into the thing. Which, well, yeah. Uh, I even rewatched. I was uh, I am Legend recently, which I hadn't seen in a long time because I get so traumatized from the dog situation in that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what started the vampire plague? A vaccine. It's a vaccine no. that they uh, cancer that they give to everyone and it turns them into zombies. I was like, oh, this movie is probably not one to recommend to people right now. Because I was like, wow, <laughs> no one would ever green light this right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like make you yeah. sick. <laughs> it's like a, good <laughs> lord. Last time I saw that was on a uh was on a flight. So I think I, I was asleep through the <laughs> the first. Well, I didn't remember that. I just knew. I, I honestly, I just didn't even remember because the thing that really just stuck with me was him and the dog, you know, and the ending. Yeah. And it's, it yeah, is. Right. It's, it's a really masterful performance by Will Smith. It's a. It's a really fantastic and very. He scary. was really good. I mean, especially like basically being alone in the whole movie. It's yeah. cast away with zombies. Cast away with zombies. So you're just like that's how you would pitch the movies. <laughs> yeah, that's oh yeah, because my Hollywood days. I still use it. It's actually very useful um, for what I do now. It's Teaching a good. And stuff. Yeah, even like when I teach creative writing, sometimes in my novels too, I'll do this um, kind of lesson with students, which I call logline exercise. But the idea is the elevator pitch, right? 
Yeah. Have you ever met an aspiring writer and asked them what their book about and then cut to you 20 minutes later, you highly regret asking <laughs> as they continue to ramble and you have no idea what their book is about? Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, so I always try to tell my students the elevator pitch is obviously if you ever end up in the elevator with someone important, how can you concisely pitch your idea? Um, I yeah. think it's I think it's useful too to get it organized in your head so while you're writing you know what the core of the story is because that's really what yeah. we do is we distill to the core um, so you don't lose sight of that. But yeah, it's amazing. Like in Hollywood, that's like a, a normal thing. Like all scripts, you have log lines. Um, but in publishing, not always. And even when you know you start to get towards publishing, a lot of times my agent or publisher asks for help for the synopsis. I've had that happen too. You know, the back cover copy. Mm. Mm -hmm, a lot mm -hmm. of times, you know, so I think it's a useful thing to do. But yeah, it is my Hollywood days. Um, it's like that movie, The Player. It's out of <laughs> It's Pretty Woman meets, you know, but tw the graduate, but 20 years later, whatever. Like, yeah. and I saw that and then I came out to intern at Disney and I was like, holy geez, this movie isn't even a satire. It's exactly <laughs> like that. I thought it was a joke. The first time I sat in the pitch, they did the same thing with all the comps. And I was like, Oh my God, Robert Allman isn't even satirizing. This is just reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is so real. <laughs> uh, so I think one time, like, I read a blurb someone wrote for me for my book, and I and that was like, oh man, that's what my book is about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Um, I know uh, the writer Anthony Dewar, Tony, a little bit. His new book um is coming out, but he wrote All the Light We Cannot See. Uh -huh. uh, this one, the Pulitzer, obviously a huge hit. And I uh, told him after that, I was like, well, when that book was coming out, I because I read it right away because I knew him, but I was like, I read the back cover copy and I was like, oh my God, this book sounds awful. It sounds so depressing. I was like, it's a blind girl in Paris, World War II. I was like, if I'm not depressed already, I'm more depressed now. But the book is m magnificent and masterful. And I was like, but that back cover copy was awful. And he goes, yeah, I know. He's like, that's even when I try to pitch stuff to my agent. I'm like, I just need to write it. It'll make sense when I write it. Because he's like, every like pitch he gives <laughs> makes no sense or sounds terrible. Um, but obviously his writing stands on its own. And he was, right. uh, I'm thinking, he was like, I'm, I, I was like, I read, you might write a sci-fi. And he was like, well, I'm not supposed to be writing it, but secretly it's uh, my favorite thing I'm working on. My agent doesn't even know. I was like, come to the dark side, write the sci-fi. And that's actually coming out. He did. <laughs> so we have you to thank for. If he doesn't acknowledge you <laughs> after this. I think I, said to him, like, holy, I think I actually literally said to him, I was like, holy shit balls. Please, sorry, can I cuss on this? Please write uh, the sci-fi. And then he signed my copy of All the Light. Holy shit balls. <laughs> So that's what it says in my copy of this like fancy <laughs> award-winning book. <laughs> and I'm probably the only that's person perfect. in the world with that inscription on that book, that's right? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> uh, he's and, great. He's so talented. Uh, where are you right now? You look I, so nice and calm and very like HGTV like I'm in house. The, uh, I call it the Mermaid Palace. <laughs> I'm in the Mermaid Palace in Malibu. Oh, nice. Uh I'm jealous of the nicer weather you must have than I do here in Pittsburgh right now. It's disgusting. I didn't we were all East Coasty nowadays. Yeah, I mean we're almost done here. We're almost done here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wife is gonna get her PhD in a couple of months. Oh, that's and so then we'll cute. see. We'll see where we go after that. Congratulations. But, well, I feel like yeah. the pandemic has just changed geography and you know I was in LA and, and kind of die hard forever and now that I'm moving out of the city I like it you yeah know, cities have changed um LA is not the same anymore it isn't yeah yeah it's it's wild it's wild mm -hmm. um so tell me about like Disney chills now uh, I know you obviously like we mentioned Drunken Masters like sci-fi um how did you do, get to doing Disney Chills and what was the experience like? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a huge horror buff and historically uh -huh. always have been. And I have some news I can't announce yet, but will be big. But I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm just going to be known as the villains writer. <laughs> I'm known for, like, scaring children. That's going to be like, <laughs> I always say <laughs> Disney moves me to scare kids. That's basically my job now. So I'm doing something. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm like. You should put on your business card, like scare of children. I know. I was like, I'm really not that creepy, am I? I'm not that dark or creepy. 
And my friend Jay Davis, who's a pretty big stand-up comedian, always opens for Dane Cook on the road. And he goes, you should do stand-up. You're really funny. Funny, but dark. Funny, but dark. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I was like, I think, is that a compliment? I don't know. I'll just take it. Um, so I already had my uh, 13th Continuum trilogy out, which I call kind of the little books that could. It's YA, but crossover multiple point of views um it's a uh-huh. little bit like sci-fi game of thrones and there's a tv yes. we're trying to put together a tv show now and that's kind of exactly the pitch in a sense um and it was sort of my love letter to asimov's foundation Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea james cameron's the abyss a couple other things so mostly i write stuff i really love um so chills came about when an editor from disney contacted me um, saying we kind of have this idea that we want to do this middle grade series with Disney villains kind of haunting kids, you know, which obviously is very tonally goosebumps the way I'm doing it. I'm a huge fan of those creepy middle grade books I grew up reading. I don't know mm. if you, want, if yeah, you ever yeah, read yeah. those. Yeah. Um, everything from, I mean, R.L. Stein wrote really great books before Goosebumps became his thing, you know, mm. and Christopher Pike, if you remember him, I absolutely loved and he scared the the a lot I mean a lot as that age um flowers in the attic even like creep me the heck out um and there was still creeps me out (laughs) and that movie I was like oh god and they like in the 80s I feel they made all this stuff for children it was was, like scarring mentally and terrifying um I had read one of the first things I ever was given was a complete brothers grim and Mm. I read those fairy tales cover to cover, back to front, over and over. I had my favorites. And I think a lot of folks sometimes forget how dark those really are. Um, Yeah, and they're incredible, you know, but dark. Um, So I was fixated in all of that. Hansel and Gretel, I was so scared of Hansel and Gretel. I had this phobia. And then what else? Like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. People forget how scary that is, right? I think Just just heart ripping and stuff like that. Child (laughs) sling, bug room. I read that they, I think they invented the PG-13 for it because it was- Yeah, 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 they did. Exactly. They were like, I don't know if PG is right for like heart ripping, monkey brain eating, child slavery. Yeah, my, my brothers and <laughs> I try to do the heart thing to each other, which is not that I like. <laughs> we thought maybe if you did it right, you could actually rip someone's heart out, you know? I was like, thanks, Indiana Jones. I mean, I love it. It's <laughs> a weird movie. I was like, oh, look how weird this it's is. It's a really weird movie. Yeah, I have the only weirder sequel is probably Gremlins 2, which I'm kind of low-key obsessed with. I just rewatched Gremlins 2. I was like, <laughs> like, who greenlit this? <laughs> it's so funny. There's a great Kim Peele sketch about Gremlins 2. It's one of my favorite Jordan Peele sketches. Um, so I love all this creepy stuff. So this editor contacted me and, you know, kind of was like, well, um, were you interested? I was like, yeah, I think they auditioned a few of some other writers. I don't know all the details on that because it's a pretty big gig. Um, but I asked for Ursula. They're like, what villain would you want? I was like, uh, Ursula, please. <laughs> because she's like, I mean, I love villains with personality. And Ursula she's- is amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I think it will, it, it's one of those characters that will be remembered even as a greater character as the years go by. You know. I agree. And she hasn't really gotten her own standalone uh, movies the way um, Maleficent or Cruella have. But, I mean, she's so extra. I'm like, she's basically a drag queen underwater. I was like, girl wears makeup underwater. Who wears makeup underwater? Like, she's so... Like, <laughs> she's like, she's, yeah, yeah. She's a sewage. <laughs> like, she flaunts it. Like, um, I heard she was inspired by Divine, obviously, of John Waters. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Right. And, and that's such a, an amazing thing. I was like, wow, Disney put a drag queen in a kid's movie way before this was like the thing to do, you know, yeah. um, step over Lady Gaga. But yeah, so um, I auditioned with a couple chapters and they hired me. And I, I remember asking at the time I was like, and they gave me a three book deal. I was like, well, why did you choose me? And they Disney said, oh, well, you write great middle grade voice. And I'd never written middle grade before. But I mean, I always say I can write anything. Um, middle grade for me is it's like all I do is remember how horrible middle school was. And I always say to people, I'm like, if you had a wonderful middle school experience, okay, m- you know, more power to you. Um, I think middle school is like the hardest age being a tween. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I 100% with you. When people ask me, I'm like, you know, those old things about like, if you could go back in time, I'm like, 
with all the knowledge and experience that I have now, I still wouldn't go back to middle school. <laughs> no, I don't even know that I go back to high school. But I think, you know, there is a thing with a lot of folks like us that, you know, I was very much the outsider. I was misunderstood. I was picked on. I was bullied for my sexual orientation and other things. I'm from a small conservative town. Um, yeah, I was like, grow I wanted to grow up and get the hell out. So, I mean, for me, I just with middle school and middle grade books, I'm like, I just lean into the angst. It's like angst, angst, angst. You know, everything is hard, fitting in, pressure. I think it's even more intensified with social media, which I really addressed in my Cruella book, which was the fourth book in my series. So anyways, that's how it started. But we started with a three book deal. I did Ursula first and then Dr. Facilier, The Shadow Man. So I asked for Ursula. Disney requested The Shadow Man for the second book. But I was super down because of the new crop of Disney villains. I think he's Mm. the greatest. Mm. He is such a wonderful character. I actually love Princess and the Frog. I think it's an underrated Disney film. And there's a whole bunch of press now because they just redid Splash Mountain to be Princess and the Frog themed, which I think is a fantastic idea. Definitely needed an update. So sometimes when um, I'm asked to do something, I find out a little bit later why they asked. So obviously the Shadow Man is important to Disney right now. And I, when I saw the Splash Mountain release, I was like, oh, that's why they wanted me to write him. Um, and then... When I finished the second book, they went ahead and offered an additional two books on top, bringing the series to five, which was kind of crazy because we were still, we hadn't even published yet. The first book wasn't even out and they gave me a five book series. Even my editor was like, Uh, crazy. He was like, I've never seen five books out of the gate like this far out of publication. So the schedule was a bit intense and insane. Um, Captain Hook ended up being the third book and I was super down for Hook. Um, originally there were a bunch of other names floated around for the third book. And I asked Disney, I said, you know, you guys have great marketing. You're Disney for this age range of reader right now, middle grade being, you know, targeted eight to 12 year olds. Um, what villains do they want to see? Like, who do they like? Because, you know, I'm older. I know who I love, but who are they obsessed with? And they hit me back with Captain Hook, which was kind of out of left field and not on our list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a very popular show on Disney Junior called Jake and the Neverland Pirates. And I know people whose kids are still obsessed with this show. So these, this age range that are now in middle school grew up watching this Peter Pan Captain Hook show. So they love Hook because now they're a little bit older. I didn't know. I did not know. I didn't know either, but I was like obviously super down. I mean, he's one of the greatest, like Peter Pan is one of the greatest stories of all time that's been done in many iterations. I even love that Hook movie with Robin Williams. Also, I think underrated. Um, And I also have a thing for pirates. (laughs) I was like, I'm so down to do a creepy pirate book. Let's go. (laughs) Because I think pirates are so fun. Um, So that one was great. And then the fourth one, we did Cruella to be paired with the film. Um, Mm. And I always say she was almost too creepy for me. I was so stressed out finishing that book. I was like, oh, God, she's she's even too dark and terrible for me. Um, and then I just did Haiti. So the Hades book just came out two weeks ago. It's the fifth book in the series. Um, he was so fun to write. This one was actually my favorite so far. Um, and I don't know what it is. I mean, Hades is just fun. He's funny. You know, he's I love Greek mythology. He's a great character. So every Disney Chills book is a completely standalone, different story, different character, different setup, different villain. And I really try to channel the ether of the original Disney film into what I'm doing, even as I'm bringing these villains into contemporary kids' lives to haunt them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah we, I have a question about writing, a, like, some, such established characters, which not everybody gets to write, uh, mm-hmm. especially in book form, maybe in films and stuff. But um, does it give you room to bring in your own own lack of a better word, your own darkness experience into it? Or or are you just like uh, sort of fenced into what's already existing in the in, in, in canon of the character? Um, I do have to go through brand management for approval, but Disney, I say this, has been amazing from the beginning to work with. When I wrote the first one, Part of Your Nightmare, the Ursula one, I was like, I'm just going to write this really scary, you know? 
And if they want me to pull it back, I will. But it's always easier to make something less scary than to make something that isn't More. scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to write it the way I would. I don't, when I write for younger readers, I don't write down to them. I write and, you know, and meet them on their level. I think you always have to be super respectful because kids are smart. You know, I don't think there's any need to pander. Um, right. and every book, we are known for our, our unhappily ever afters. Every Disney Chills book has a dark and terrible ending. Nothing good ever happens in Disney Chills. And I think when the first book came out, uh, readers were really shocked because especially with the Disney brand, everyone thinks it's going to work out. Everyone yeah. thinks you're going to get that. And when that first book dropped and people got to the end, they were like, wait, what? What? No way. And so um, my readers say, well, <laughs> the book has gotten progressively darker and every ending keeps getting darker. But it is kind of funny when a reader jumps in like at a later book because my fans are used to it now. Um, I think there was an Amazon review late, recently that was really hilarious. Um, this reader gave it four stars and really loved it, but he was very upset that um, there's a joke um, the older brother Phil makes about Hades where he calls him an emo god dude. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, right? You know, and yeah. this guy wrote a big, that is, he's, Hades is not emo. The underworld is not emo. And like, put this whole, like, yeah, Jan. <laughs> I was like <laughs> laughing so hard. But and when they're like, but it redeems itself because the character likes Nirvana and Green Day punk rock bands that I like. <laughs> I was like laughing so hard. It's probably like a ten year old. I don't even know. But then uh, I think amazing. the reason. But then he was basically the review in the end was basically he was just so disturbed by the end, like so upset by it very clearly. And I was like, oh, I love that. If I get it like a four star because he's just so upset at the end, I was like, I I'll take it. Yeah. Um, so they've been really great about letting me craft scares and kind of be really creative with what I do because I have a, a big background in horror. The first film I ever worked on was Sex Chainsaw Massacre. I worked with Dave Scow to help craft Leatherface's backstory for the prequel. I worked on Freddy vs. Jason was made when I was at New Line, which was the house that Freddy built. My old boss made Lord of the Rings. Um, so I love creepy, creepy, creepy. Um, so they've been really amazing about letting me do it. And I do kind of tailor them to these endings. Um, my sixth book is next year. It's Maleficent, my favorite. Oh, dang. <laughs> I know. I was Wait, nervous to write book. her. That's sixth book will be my Maleficent book. So It'll be out they, uh, next they summer. Gave, uh, they gave you even more books to do after your five books? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I could, I, I'm under a new two book deal. They'll, it, we're, our, the series will go to seven books now, which is super exciting um book seven tbd um maleficent is drafted so we're a go um i was a little nervous to tackle her because she's my favorite and i wanted to do her justice um yeah. so what i do with the original films is i really look at the themes and i really try to distill that down um and you know for the characters voices that i really watch the movies for because the actors that voice these villains are phenomenally great yeah so, you know, that's one of the best things about them. Um, so that I try to keep very true to the original in terms of the yeah, voice. Yeah. and how Because they all have very specific ways they talk. You know, James Wood's voicing of Hades is so good. It's like a used car salesman, but he's the god of the underworld, right? <laughs> I read somewhere that he, originally Hades was written very straight when they were doing the Hercules movie. And they were thinking Jack Nicholson or something. And then James Woods came in and just kind of read it like a used car salesman. And they were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And they <laughs> read the whole character for his his voicing. Where he's like, hey, Zeus, get off of my cloud. It's a small underworld after all. Like all this like funny stuff he says. And um, I think he's voiced Hades in every iteration of Hades, including the video games. Because he just loves voicing Hades that much. So... Uh... It was, it's fun to try to capture it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually a bigger fan of Hercules than Lion King, which is a very unpopular Disney opinion. I feel like the Hercules film got very overshadowed because it came out right around mm. Lion King. Um, and I think it's it's one of the the most underrated Disney films. I love the Hercules movie. The animation's great, yeah, I too. I gotta revisit it. I gotta revisit it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's also the horniest yeah. Disney movie, but we can discuss that another time. <laughs> Everyone in it is very good looking. I'm like, these are the, the most hot Disney characters. <laughs> where, where does your love of horror come from? Like you said, it was from childhood, like reading, you've been reading these books from childhood. Is it just from reading or from like experiences or? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a pretty haunted house in rural Virginia. Wait, wait in Virginia, okay. Yeah, it was a very old house um, that dated back to like colonial times. 
Mm -hmm. It started as a log cabin and was built up in a very strange way. And I I am convinced. Wait, are we talking like strange, like like Winchester house kind of strange? Or what what do you mean by strange? quite that extreme but some things like that like I had a door in my bedroom that should have been a door that went to the outside but went to the attic and it had like window panes that had been painted over and I was terrified of this creepy kind of back part of the house that had this like red and black swirl carpet and like wood paneling it's totally like something out of a 70s horror film and yeah I had my parents even put a lock on the door that I could close like a bolt because I was terrified of what happened back there at night um, but when I was a little kid, we had one of those creepy horror movie basements, you know, like what you see with the yeah. creepy. Yeah, the, I mean, the, 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 those basements where I'm like, don't go in the basement. Don't, don't go, go in. in. <laughs> well, in California, they don't really have basements. But as you know, you're in the East Coast now, like actually yeah. most houses do have them. And a lot of the older houses, it's those creepy ones from the movies, like the cabin in the woods basement. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, when I was a little kid poking around down there, I found a tombstone for an eight month old baby that had probably been buried in the cellar. Um, Because back in the olden days, when you couldn't, if a baby died in the winter and you couldn't break ground outside, you would bury them in the cellar. So that convinced me beyond anything else. And there were a lot of random like murders that happened in this house and around this house. So there's some (laughs) energy vortex and I'm like more sensitive to these things, I think, than most people. I think a lot of kids are. Yeah, well, I mean, other than the creepy factor of, you know, like a baby, grave in the basement like were you experiencing things yeah I think you know there are things that I would see I think I'm pretty good I even do it here at putting protections around my places um Mm -hmm. because I am extra sensitive to energy and to these things so I think that whatever I was doing in my room I was able to protect it um yeah I used to like have this vision of like especially when I was reading it I love Stephen King of like Pennywise watching me from the foot of my bed as I slept so I don't know what that was was very (laughs) comforting and I'm always up really late I'm even now I'm total like a night person and I used to feel like I'd always get in trouble for being up late and I was always reading alone late at night and I feel like that's an it's a strange time you know um there's definitely something energetically going on there yeah, like, 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 <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's... we we have basements in Pittsburgh, and mm-hmm. like the basements for some reason have a n- non functional toilet. Oh my gosh. And there's all these different theories of why basements have toilets <laughs> that don't work. Yeah, there are all these. So, this apartment has a toilet in the basement. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, I think anything that's had that much history and that much, you know, energy coming through. And, you know, when you live somewhere like in California, it's different because it's just so much newer. But, you know, like these like back, back east and I went to Harvard as well. Harvard has weird energy around that campus. Um, but there's a lot of history, which means a lot of people have come through, which also means often people have either passed or died mm-hmm. in a property. There can be an energy uh, that's left. And I always just say, I think some people are, are more sensitive all the way to actually, I guess, communicating. And some people like me, um, it depends. I, I do think I channel for my work. I use that a lot. Um, just kind of it's hard to explain because I guess you could call it a muse or a creative process, but sometimes I think there's something more to it. I mean, creative people tend to be more sensitive yeah. in general. Has it ever gotten scary? Like, I mean, your channel. Well, yeah. Productive, oh, that house, but... Yeah, there was, yeah, that house definitely, I never felt uh, very settled or comfortable there, which is how old were you when you left? Um, when I went to college, my parents did a renovation on it when I was in high school, which I think shifted some things around and they kind of got rid of that creepy area that I was talking about. Um, but then I went to Harvard and Harvard also has a lot going on yeah. there. And there's a very unsettled energy there. I just think there's so much people with so much expectation that cycle through. Um, uh-huh. Every time I go back there, I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird here. You know, it's not it's not a nice place. It's not a content place. You know. Yeah, yeah. I visited, I visited Yale because uh, my wife is a Yale person, um, mm-hmm. and just walking through some of those buildings, I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, my yeah. job freshman year, I worked in the stacks at Widener Library, and I would be reshelving books. I'd be like, I don't think anyone's been back here in like 20 years because it's. <laughs> I think it's one of the biggest libraries in the world. Uh -huh. so the stacks are like old. Yeah. Well, it was a really cool job, but a really strange one. It was definitely, yeah. again, felt very haunted. There's a lot of stories about stuff like that. Um, ghosts and things at places like this. In that library? Yeah. I mean, there's also that whole, you're supposed to have, like, sex in the stacks. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, too, yeah. You know about that. I'm sure that's at other schools, right? <laughs> yeah. I like, no, I heard that when I went to Yale. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, y'all are nerdy. <laughs> this is like... You go to another school, it's just frat parties. Here, it's like library hookups. <laughs> Y'all are bunch of nerds. <laughs> You're hooking up in the library among ghosts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, then. It, again, sounds like the beginning of a horror movie, right? Yeah. So you you find... You, you're pretty comfortable in, in the realm of horror and... Ghosts yeah. and spiritual and stuff like that. Well, very comfortable. And, you know, it's interesting because um, I can't say what I'm writing next yet. But knowing what they are giving me and what they want me to do, I'm like, holy hell, I'm going to be the villains writer. Like, I'm going to be known for this. This is wild. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even um, my debut graphic novel, Spectre Deep Six, which isn't strictly horror. I mean, it's paranormal. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, I tend to do things that, that mash a lot of genres or that have different elements. Spectre Deep Six is about, imagine if the most elite soldiers we have who die are brought back by military scientists and reanimated as ghosts, actual specters to continue to carry out missions for the government in exchange for day passes to haunt their old lives and fix their unfinished business. So it's a team of six diverse Spectre agents. They all left different stuff behind that's all messed up. So it's almost like secret lives of ghosts, you know, uh -huh. so they have different problems they're trying to fix from when they died. And they're not really happy to be back. And my favorite character is this guy, John Song, who killed himself. He's like an alcoholic, tried to kill himself. They brought him back. So he's extra pissed off to be back because <laughs> he's like, dude, I want it out. What the hell is this bullshit, right? <laughs> Um, and he's super dark. I love him. They're just like, uh, there's a line in the beginning of the book. It's a graphic novel, of course. I did it with Jules Rivera, where uh, they go, uh, why don't you ask John? He always tells the truth. John, what do you think? He goes, when I expect, when I killed myself, I expected to stay dead. And they go, too much truth, John, too much. Um, <laughs> he kind of ends up being the unintentional hero in the book. So it's kind of built off a lot of pre-existing kind of ghost mythology in terms of how the specters function and what they can and can't do in terms of the world world and the rules. Um, and that got nominated for a Stoker Award, which, as you probably know, is the Horror Writers Association. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing organization. It's a very prestigious award. And it's the first time I ever did a graphic novel. So I was like, oh, yeah, awesome. This is so cool. Um, and it isn't it, it's a blend of sci fi and horror, I suppose, um, but also like superhero action beats. So. You know, it's not technically scary, scary, but I mean, I guess there's a witch in it. There's some, he ends up getting a witch girlfriend, <laughs> John does. And like, there's some witch <laughs> ghost sex, I guess. Thank you, Anne Rice. <laughs> so ghost guess, sex in the ghost library at the ghost college. Yeah, there's a lot of like, I guess, unusual elements in Spectre Deep Six. Um, but I'm also like, I, I do write a lot of sci-fi, but um, I love sci-fi horror blends like Alien is mm -hmm. one of my favorite movies of all time but we can even go back to like you know carpenter's the thing you know event there's horizon a, oh i'm obsessed with event horizon yeah. i'm like hellraiser in space <laughs> yeah. i just i rewatch that movie probably every few months because uh my favorite horror franchise which not everyone knows is hellraiser huge mm. huge, huge, huge i movie. literally took my family my mom, dad, to watch Hellraiser when they came out, and my mom wanted to murder me afterwards. <laughs> I, you know, it's such a weird... Um, that movie is just so special, and Clive obviously directed it, and it was made for a million dollars. The amount, the caliber of the makeup effects in that is stellar. And I even love the cheesy VFX that apparently they ran out of money and Clive and his friend got drunk over a weekend and added those cheesy effects themselves, like hand painting it onto the film. I even love that because, you know, I, I you know, studied film in school and I, I know what it's like when you're trying to make low budget stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And start to budget. Um, I think that movie is just so spectacular. And I love the novella Hellbound Heart that it's based on. Um, and, and I love the second Hellraiser, which I think is just like, let's just get even weirder and have some weird French guy come in and like, let's go. Um, but those movies, I mean, when I was younger, they they scared me so bad. But, you know, and I think, you know, practical effects always are scarier, even now, even when they look cheesy. Because your brain tells can tell the difference between CGI and practical. Yeah. Practical is always scarier. Um, so I love Clive. I love his books of blood. Um, I am going to be doing a short story for Weird Tales coming up, um, I think, next year. Um, and it's going to be a dark detective occult type of thing. Um, and I'm definitely going to channel my Clive Barker, you know, because I don't think anyone does that type of stuff better than him. With you know, I, speaking of Hellraiser, the other day, I don't know what app I was scrolling on the Apple TV, but... Oh, no, no. I was on, uh, never mind. I can't remember. But it was like Hellraiser was categorized in sensual film. And I was like, at first I laughed. And then I was like. Oh, it is. It's a, it's a love story. <laughs> yeah. I was like. Hmm. <laughs> well, it, it's, a, it, it's a, I always say that the novella in particular is because they're not really from hell. It's a, it's a different dimension where pleasure is pain right and it's yeah. it's very much a pandora's box story of course we yeah. literally have the leviathan configuration yeah. is literally our pandora's box i totally want one too when i get one they sell them um you don't want it you don't want it don't do it i know but i kind of do i have a lot of uh, i have a couple hellraiser funkos i even found chatterer <laughs> i was so excited to get chatterer but um yeah and the novella is is quite different but it is very much this twisted love story where she tries to bring Frank, her lover. She's her, her, she was cheating on her husband with her husband's brother back from the dead. And a lot of Clive Barker horror is very um, based in sexuality. Um, and that has to do, I think, with his own personal history too. And that he, you know, uh, he's gay, but he's a bit older. Um, and I just know that it probably was less acceptable at a certain point. Yeah. And most people, you know, on that spectrum wrestle with aspects of their identity you know, and obviously there's a lot of messaging that it's evil or it's bad or it's this or it's that. Even still now, even um, I'm a very sex positive person, but even in, you know, you know, different sorts of interests or non-traditional uh, types of lifestyles, which I think we should be accepting of, you know, consenting and this and that. Um, so I think a lot of his horror is very much rooted in all of that. And you can see that because, you know, how is there's totally like BDSM, like chains and like torture? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so I, mean, I can totally see why we get categorized. And like I said, it, it is a twisted love story. It's sort of a Frankenstein love story, you know. But that's what's happening is she's trying to bring her lover back. Yeah. You know, in a very yeah. gruesome way. But yeah, I, I think that's probably the core of why they're so good and why a lot of his horror is so good. I would say this. I can read Stephen King and I'm chill. It's my favorite Stephen King book, the only one that actually kind of scares me. But Clive Barker, oh gosh, I'll be up for days. I'm like, how? Like, I'll read a two page scene and I'll be have to put it down. I'll be like, how did he scare me that bad in two pages? Like, that's <laughs> power. How did he do it? I'll be like reading, like, doo, 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 I'm totally cool. And then I read this one scene and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> right? Yeah. He's one of, um, I mean, for me, he's one of my favorite horror writers. I'm a huge fan of Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his um, prose is beautiful. He's a good writer. He's a really yeah. good writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, we obviously know working in genres and stuff like, you know, it's changed a lot. But, you know, genre writers have been put down for so long as like, it's just so freaking long. <laughs> well, yeah, we don't really usually get the respect of like the mainstream, what they call literary fiction. And I think, you know, before I started writing, I was like, oh, literary fiction are like, they're the better writers. And what I would have come to know having like, you know, been the only genre writer at a lot of prestigious programs like Ten House, where I'm like, hi, I'm the weird writer. Um, and these people have their MFAs and PhDs in creative writing, and they're trying to write the great American novel or whatever, um, is that literary fiction is just another genre, right? A literary fiction has its own tropes, styles, preoccupations, but those writers aren't any better than the writers that write in other arenas. And yeah. that's and I'm friends with a lot of them. And I will tell you this, a lot of the lit fiction people have been coming very heavily into genre. Why? Mm. It's where the fun is and the money is. Yeah. Money, right. And that's your, you know, passage, you know, yeah. that 
by Justin Cronin. That's um, I mentioned Anthony Dewar just won the Pulitzer yeah, for his yeah. book, epic. His book has a big sci-fi generation ship component. Cloud Cuckoo Land's about to drop. Marlon James, who I love and adore, he calls me LA. He'll be like, "How's LA doing?" He's Jamaican. <laughs> he's the best. Absolutely worship him. Um, he's doing his Game of Thrones African trilogy. You know, and when I first yeah, we had him, the first book. Yeah. Yeah, when I first hung out with him, he um. It was, I would say it's before he had won the Man Booker Prize. It's before he became, you know, 100 yeah, yeah. people. I always make fun of him a little bit or tease him for that. Um, it was uh, when Brief History of Selling Killings was out. Um, and he was just thinking about it. And I was like, because he's such a nerd. Like, he loves this stuff. Like, I think he even hand drew the maps for it. And I was like, dude, write it. I was like, do it, do it, do it. It's so fun. If you start, if you have a predilection like this stuff and start writing it, it's such a blast. And he, I think, yeah. it just walked out on the second book, which is like this long, you know, it's Marlon. But um, <laughs> the first book is like that. <laughs> yeah, or like Victor Laval, who um, I was in his novel workshop then, and they think they just announced Changeling is moving yeah, forward. Yeah, they did. They did. Beautiful casting, Kelly Marcel's doing it. Um, I love that book, that Victor Laval book. And he was just, when I was working with him, was had a partial and was writing it and read this great creepy scene from it. But he's writing, they call it literary horror, but he kind of is like, uh, you know, it's like, Okay, sure. Just because he has that MFA background, you know, he writes literary yeah. horror. Um, but, you know, he kind of talked to me about it at the time. This is a while ago where he was like, you know, if you don't have um, certain things on your resume, you're never going to be up for those certain awards. It's a very myopic mm. kind of culture around those prestigious literary awards. So if you don't have that MFA, if you didn't do that short story collection, whatever, even if you um, are as good as these other writers, it's like Stephen King's never going to win those awards. Now, is yeah. there a better writer than Stephen King? I don't think so. Um, I think he's our Charles Dickens. I always tell people this. I'm like, Charles Dickens, you know, a writer who is popular in his own time, who is writing to entertain. Yeah. And people forget that Dickens was serialized in newspapers. He wanted to hook you. He wanted to entertain you. He was popular, you know, and I think, you know, yeah. we obviously consider him one of the great novelists you know, of yeah. all time. Um, and Stephen King is that for me. I think that, you know, he's prolific, he's popular, but he's a damn good storyteller. Yeah. You know, but he's never going to win your, he's never going to win any of these like fancy awards that, you know, folks like Victor will win. Um, you know, and a lot, so, and a lot of genre writers are like that where we don't often come up because they don't really like to teach us in MFAs. Yeah, um, yeah. You probably know this, like um, there are certain programs that are very friendly to genre writers, but they're far and few between. And and then also the other thing that MFAs are not real friendly to is uh, writing for younger readers. Yeah. Right. If you want to write middle grade or YA, there are exceptions and there are some programs. I know I know some of the ones that are good, but, you know, you're you know, they, they teach a certain type of writing for the most part or look for it. So if you're writing stuff like what I tend to write, you know, um, they don't really teach that. So most writers who do this kind of stuff, we're kind of either self-taught, right. Or kind of yeah. came up just doing it. Like, like my friend Dave Scout and Dave's amazing. He's, he's coined the term Splatterpunk in the eighties. You know, he, he wrote the crow, the movie. Uh, he wrote the Texas chainsaw prequel for me. Um, and he is always has short stories, comics. He does a lot of stuff for John Carpenter. And yeah. he's a great writer. Yeah. Uh, speaking of like the writing for middle grade and even younger, yeah. I have a question for you. Like both as a writer and as a reader, um, how, why, I don't know if it's a why question or a how question, but regarding the importance of kids reading or you know being exposed to like horror stories or scary stories um you know both as a reader and as a writer what's your take on that i know for me as a kid one of my favorite memories and scariest memories two are one watching abbott and costello meets frankenstein for the first time and the other being my cousin my favorite cousin diane she used to make me, as a little kid, like three or four years old, she would get little kids around, have us do this thing where we covered ourselves with the blanket but exposed our feet. <laughs> and then she would tell a scary story. And something about that, just having our feet exposed for some reason, just scared us even more. And that you can, like, totally was super important. Yeah. yeah. 
I have, it's a great question, Chiwan. I'm so glad you brought it up because I'm very passionate about this and I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I think um, something you're pointing to here is resilience, right? Is, you know, I always say this, like, this is why I love writing fiction and I love horror movies because you want to know what really scares me? It's not The Conjuring, although it does. It's the news, right? <laughs> the scariest, like, if, honestly, like, I'm like, what sci-fi writer is writing the headlines these days? It's like... <laughs> 2022 brought to you by Stephen King, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> like he's literally yeah, yeah, yeah. headlines or something directed by John Carpenter. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, I know there's people are addicted to true crime shows. I was like, you want to know what really scares me? Serial killer stuff, like true crime, like things that are real, like Ted Bundy. Mm. I don't know that there's anything scarier to me than him. Why? Because he was real, right? Yeah. You know, versus, you know, these things like, <laughs> you know, we're talking about Disney villains. Um, you know, that's where you can learn to deal with those feelings and those emotions in a, in a safe context, you know, because mm. we're going to get to the end of a book and it'll be the end, you know, and the story's right. complete or the end of a movie and it's the end and we come back out of it. We're not in it completely. Um, so I think it's actually really helpful. And I think actually the most well-adjusted people are the people who write horror like <laughs> it because we're at peace with the darkness, you know, which is very much just a part of reality. Mm -hmm. you know, like pick up any any you know newspaper or you know flip through it on your phone and i will tell you right now what you're going to read there is scarier than anything i'm writing like you know it's basically like living in a horror film and the other big thing i think and this is why i love writing for younger readers and i'm intending to do it my whole career um and a lot of kid lit writers like me uh will have stories where people are like oh well when are you gonna like grow up and write like an important book or a real book and we're like you know, these are real books. What are you talking about? Right? Like there's that, that snobbery that you mentioned, um, which we see with Sean yeah. Reckon. You know, we can even see it. Um, the awards have gotten a little better, but I used to be like, dude, like we mentioned I Am Legend. A lot of times some of the best television, some of the best films are these genre films, um, but they don't tend to get the mainstream respect again as being real cinema. Um, I worked right. on Lord of the Rings and that was kind of amazing because we did win those 14 Oscars and it I think kind of shows how the caliber of storytelling really is there if you do it right yeah. and we yeah. were honored for it um but you know the best thing you can do for kids is to get them reading yeah I, I think if you read any um study on you know child development anything on that um it'll show you just how good it is for even even things like developing empathy right mm-hmm that's that um, there's a great line in a game of Thrones where it says something like a man who never reads lives one life. A man who reads lives hundreds of lives. Right. And so with kids, it's the hugest thing. And it kind of doesn't matter what they're reading, just that so you get them reading. And nowadays there's how much distraction for their time, energy, and attention. You know, like I mentioned when I was growing up, well, I grew up in the eighties, right? We didn't have cell phones. I didn't have a television in my room. And I sure wasn't allowed out of that room after bedtime, right? This was, you know, there was no too much. You're like, you go there. back in your room with your ghost and then just stay in there. Yeah, you stay in there with those ghosts and, and so you're up until the middle of the night. Right. So, but you know that. And, and we have video games. But again, it wasn't this like 24-7 kind of access. So I always say, um, you know, nowadays you're competing for a lot. So to get a kid to read a book, I think is even harder. And studies also show that the hardest to reach our younger boys. Um, publishing actually really caters to girls and there is a belief, which I guess may be true, that they're easier to get to and easier to get them to read. Um, so younger boys are considered the hardest. And what's interesting about what I write is um, those are a lot of my biggest fans are those like eight to 13 year old boys. Um, and that started with my Continuum trilogy. I remember when the third book came out and these are like big, like kind of dense books, like over, you know, 120,000 words. And this little kid came to the book launch for my third book. He must have been eight years old. And he was already halfway through the book. And his dad was like, he's never met an author before, but he's obsessed with your books. And he made sure we came here every week to make sure your event would actually happen. And he had just bought it and was already halfway through it. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Amazing. Um, and with Disney Chills in particular, we do even say this, that it's great for reluctant readers. And a lot of teachers... Mm. 
are really big fans of my Disney Chill series and really stock them in their classrooms um, because kids love them and they're fun and they consider them really excellent for reaching what we call reluctant readers. Um, and I'll get letters from parents saying, you know, school really killed my kid's love of reading. Um, and then she found your series and now she can't stop talking about it and she's devouring it. <laughs> they'll be like, well, they promise she won't read anything else yet. She just loves you. But, you know, at the same <laughs> time, you know, to see parents being like, it's just, you know, how relieved they are to see their kid actually enjoying a book. And I always say, you know, you can't make a 10 year old do anything they don't want to do exactly, but they're sure not going to finish a book in a day or two or read it multiple times and have some of my series unless they really love it. Right. Yeah. That's just kids are so unfiltered that way. Um, so for me, there's nothing better than that kind of giving that experience to a younger reader. Cause it's what I, you know, how I was, I was that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was that kid that was yeah, always. No. And, and when we're kids, I think, I mean, for me anyways, and the kids around me, I think when we first started telling stories, it was some version of a horror story, whether oh. it was like some exaggerated version of what happens at home or actually tales we've heard, like folk tales and stuff. But they were all like scary stories. Like we were on this <laughs> mode of like, I'll tell the scarier story. Well, yeah, when you have summer parties, you remember scary stories to tell in the dark? We would sit around oh, yeah. and read those stories like with flashlights, you know. Maybe it was very them. disappointing. <laughs> oh, I, I know. I was like, well, I was so excited. And then I was like, huh? No. <laughs> but I think, I think maybe some of the magic was lost. I mean, there was just that just, I think it was knowing that it was yeah. like kind of this forbidden book was um, what made it fun. You know, yeah. you're not supposed to be doing it. Well, because horror revolves always around a transgression. I always say this character does something they know they're not supposed to do. You understand why, but it's the transgression. You open, you're told not to open the Pandora's box. You open it anyway. A, yeah, I think that's a really great point. And like, I think that was part of why I love, even though I was frightened to death when I first started seeing ghosts and stuff, there was this sense of like, I was seeing something I wasn't supposed to. You know, so I wanted it. Even as I was frightened to death, I was like, I want it because I'm not supposed to see this. Well, I think we just touched on it. There's something very interesting. And I do think there, I always say this because I am a sci-fi writer, but people really get into this. Well, how can you believe in this? It's not science. I'll say that stuff about astrology. And I'm like, here's the deal. Science is the attempt to explain the known world, right? Yeah. So there are things that exist and, you know, so there are things that science has explained. So like back in the day, right, we didn't know what caused gravity, but everyone knew what happened if you jumped off a bridge. <laughs> so we lived with gravity. We knew it was a very real thing, but we didn't have like the scientific explanation. That didn't mean it didn't exist. It just meant we hadn't explained it. So I started yeah. telling you, I'm like, so science is the attempt to explain the known world, the world that already exists. So there's things that science has explained and things that science hasn't yet explained, but it doesn't mean that they aren't real, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and that's, and I believe in science to that level, right? Um, but, you know, I always say it like this, you know, astrology is a very ancient human thing. And we used to be able to navigate by the stars, like celestial navigation. We could get from freaking like Japan to Hawaii, in a canoe in the ocean, which is kind of amazing. Um, so the way I always say it is like, I can prove that the sun affects everything on earth. Of course, that's easy. Even just hormones, your your body, yeah. everything. I can prove the moon, I live on the ocean. I mean, you wanna know what the moon does, live on the beach for a year, right? Yeah. And even old farmer's almanacs, plant growth cycles. Okay, so there are scientific things that show these two bodies, which exert great mass on us, cause things. Okay, so there's other planets, right? Like Jupiter. How big is Jupiter? It's like so hard to even conceive. Um, just because science hasn't explained what Jupiter is doing to you doesn't mean that that huge mass isn't doing stuff, depending on where we are in orbit, right? And that's where yeah. the astronomy comes in. And I say that's the clumsy human attempt to explain something that is absolutely real. It is absolutely real, which is to say we are on this planet and other bodies are exerting influences. And those influences affect things on this planet, right? But it doesn't yeah. mean it's like, oh, you believe in mumbo jumbo. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, and another big pet peeve of mine is discounting the wisdom of ancient humans. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, right. ancient human, right? And I feel like we often look down on ancient cultures or humans. Dude, they built those pyramids. They had like crazy technology a long time ago, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The ancient yeah. alien stuff. Yeah. So, and it's so. It's aliens. Yeah. <laughs> 
people I live with them for sure. But I don't know like yeah. if they're here yet or not. But yeah, but you know, paranormal stuff is similar, right? Um, that's why I think I love Ghostbusters when it came out, right? Because do you remember at the beginning where he's like doing the scientific study? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And he's like, <laughs> the, the, the hot girl, and he's like telling her everything. The guy keeps getting buzzed. He's like, he's zapping. <laughs> but I think I like Ghostbusters because it took, because they are like science characters and took paranormal. It's one of my favorite films. That's why I like Flatliners. Flatliners, huge influence on my graphic mm. novel, Dr. Deep Six. But again, taking science and pairing it with mm. ghost mm-hmm. stuff. Like I thought Flatliners was a really fun because they're medical students, right? Yeah. Um, it's a great concept and they uh, flatline themselves on purpose, resuscitate themselves, but they bring back ghosts and demons from their past. Yeah. Um, do you believe in demons or what do you feel about conjuring stuff? I mean, I, oh yeah, I believe in everything. I believe in everything. I mean, my, yeah. my, dad's a, my dad's a retired pastor. So he, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, conjuring, so I, trust me, I, do, I believe in demons. <laughs> Yeah, well, the Conjuring universe, I think, is one of the most sophisticated and best cinematic universes that anyone's done in recent times, and it's so consistent. But I think what makes Conjuring great, aside from the the great 70s flair, when we got a lot of our best horror films, is that the Warrens are very much were real. Like, it was, these yeah, were... Yeah, I just real. watched their documentary on them, and it's just a love story. It's really a love story. They practically spent every single day with each other. They're working so together. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about the films. My friend David Leslie Johnson writes those, and he's an incredible writer. Came up under uh, Frank Darabont, does a lot of Walking Dead. I, I used to run with a lot of horror writers and people back in the day. I gotta uh, hang out with you and your horror writer friends because they're like all my heroes. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're so fun. Well, he also writes Aquaman. Um, they're in production on the second one. I love Aquaman. I love James Wan. Huge Saw fan. Um, obviously, James does Conjuring. And I think, you know, that's one of the greatest things about those movies, which is very true to the story, is that they really frame it around their relationship and their love story. And I loved The Third Conjuring. And again, it's just so much about their connection to each other. And she's the one that's the more sensitive one. But he's kind of almost like her protector, you know, and, and believes her, you know. And I think that their relationship, which, as you mentioned, is very real, um, is kind of the core of those films, you yeah. know, that trying to help people. And I'm like, there's all these things where I'm like, you need to call in the words. That's some creepy <laughs> stuff. I don't actually have kids, but I'll have my friends who'll tell me stories about creepy stuff their kids do. Apparently, if you have kids, I don't know if you do, they do creepy things. And my friend moved into a new house that was kind of old. And her son goes, I really like it here, except for the old man that lives in my room. <laughs> and she was like, all right, we get it. And I was like, but see, I would be a bad parent because if my kid told me something creepy, I'd be like, you're right. We need to burn the house. <laughs> Let's take an exorcist in here. Like, I wouldn't, like, calm them and soothe them. I'd be like, where's the ghost? Show me. Tell me what they did. Because I would just totally be with them. I'd be like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, the old man that lives in my room that I talk to every night. Oh, I would, like, be like, that's it. We're moving. What's his name? <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, let's go. Um, I wouldn't be the parent that's like, oh, ghosts aren't real. You're fine. <laughs> like, that would yeah, be my, me. My parents taught me as a child that ghosts were real because I started seeing ghosts when I was like two, three years old. So it was, but it, it wasn't scary, you know? And yeah, there was an interesting thing that happened um, when I was first dating my new boyfriend and Um, I took a picture on the beach and I have a friend on social media who's a fan of my Disney Chills books who uh, is a medium. And he's like, oh, you captured an orb. I didn't even notice in this picture. But, you know, you know what an orb is in a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, And he was totally right. And um, the same day it was, I think it was my grandmother and my boyfriend was like, he's very sensitive to all this. He was like, yeah, I think she's worried about you. Like she just is like hanging out to make sure that I'm okay and she wants me to know that if I'm not <laughs> good to you she's gonna come after me basically and I was <laughs> like sounds like Jean that's right. and, you're like yeah. that's right <laughs> yeah I thought it was really interesting because I never knew her but she was um back in the old days uh, a burlesque dancer in Hollywood and also in a lot of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers films as a dancer she was contracted with Paramount and um, she dated a lot of movie stars, including um, the guy that played Robin Hood. What's his name? Errol Flynn. That was her boyfriend. And my mom's uh, favorite. Your mom's? Yeah, my mom's favorite was Errol Flynn. My dad's favorite was, uh, uh, what's his name? Guy oh, with the wind guy. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, Clark Gable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently he got, well, here's the crazy thing my mom found out. So he got, Errol Flynn got charged with statutory rape. And it was like big, like front page news because he's a major celebrity. And it was from a girl that worked at the club with my grandmother, who was another dancer who was underage. But my grandmother testified at trial. There's pictures of Jean Longworth on the witness stand, like in the LA Times, testifying to defend him because she claims it was a setup and they were just trying to get money from him and they trapped him. So she testified to defend him in his statutory rape trial. Yeah, I was like, oh my God. But I mean, to be fair, I know we're in this hashtag me too. And I'm obviously very um, supportive of women, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some bad actors occasionally, especially dealing with celebrities. I mean, that's like the Michael Jackson of it all. Like, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there are stalkers, there are people that might want to yeah. take it so and again I wasn't there I don't know anything um I just know that this is the thing that happened and um but I think with her back then you had to get married and have kids like you aged out of being able to have a, a career yeah, like yeah. that you know so she I think when he broke up with her it broke her heart and she met my grandfather who was you know an air force pilot this is all world war ii stuff married her moved her to west texas where she had three kids and she got very depressed and became an alcoholic you know um Mad Men style they were both probably alcoholics I feel like when I watch yeah, Mad Men yeah. I'm like that was that generation right yeah and they were yeah, all course. functioning <laughs> alcoholics yeah, yeah. where the kids are mixing the drinks for them at like five o'clock um and she would always get upset and threaten to run away back to Hollywood to her glory days so I feel like there's an element of her wanting me to have the career that she couldn't have at my age especially you know because mm. back then women yeah yeah, yeah. You yeah. couldn't, and you were supposed to settle down and be a housewife and raise kids, especially when you got to a certain age, you know. Um, and obviously, I'm, you know, felt like I'm just getting started with everything I want to do. So I feel like maybe that was part of it too, was she doesn't want me to give up my dreams the way she had to. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andrew was Amazing. like, was like I could feel she was like hanging out around here, and like she didn't want me because that's the medium goes i think it's your grandmother he goes yeah it's your grandmother <laughs> he goes i don't want to tell you because i don't want to scare you but i think she's just like very protective of you <laughs> and uh, she wanted to check me out and make sure i'm okay <laughs> so thanks grandma <laughs> for well, my thanks friend. grandma <laughs> thanks jenna for this incredible conversation can you read us a couple of minutes of uh, stuff from your new book yeah, one of the I'll chills uh, this is from the Hades. I'll read you one quick scare scene. And this is the latest book, yeah? Yeah, this is the fifth book. Um, the cool thing about chills is you don't need to read them in any particular order because they're all standalone. So you can even just be like, who's my favorite villain? Who do I want to read? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a scene. This takes place in a town called Mount Olympus um, uh, with a 12-year-old named Hector. So he's competing for something called the Zeus Cup. So they live in this Midwest town called Mount Olympus that has a lot. So obviously we're channeling Greek mythology, a lot of like, you know, Greek statues. And they host something called the Spartan Rung that's very famous. And it's for 12 year olds to race. And you win something called the Zeus Cup. And he's trained his whole life to try to win this cup. Um, so he's in the truck leaving, uh, going to practice with his brother. So because their truck curved around the central town square, which had large marble statues of famous Greek gods. The town's founders had been, uh, had been big on celebrating their history and culture. Under the leafy trees and scattered among the benches where people lounged and snacked and played with their kids stood the statues. Zeus, Hera, the Fates, the Muses, Pegasus, Hercules, and of course Hades in the middle of it all. He was the god of the underworld. Hector shuddered, picturing the god who ruled over the souls doomed to the river Styx. He'd loved their father's lesson on Greek mythology, particularly because it related to their town. He knew the names of all the gods by heart and what they controlled. The Hades statue stood a little bit taller than the others, and he looked creepier, too. It was a befitting of his role. Hector's eyes locked onto the statue of Hades. The god had spiky, needle-like teeth and a wicked grin and wore long robes. Flames took the place of his hair curling upward into a peak. Suddenly, for a split second, the hair flashed with blue flames. The statue's eyes lit up yellow and locked onto Hector. They bored into him. Hector flinched in shock and grabbed his brother's arm. Phil jerked the steering wheel in surprise, and before Hector could blink, with a deafening squeal of the tires, the car veered to the side of the road. Nice. Boom, 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 boom. 
as Hades from the Disney Chill series that, and you're writing that under Vera Strange, yeah? Yeah, my Disney series is under Vera Strange. We wanted to come up with a creepy pen name for kids because nice. this is a stage where we just wanted them to be like, who's this weird creepy person that writes these scary <laughs> books? Because I feel like when you're that young, like you, you have yeah, all these yeah, ideas. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. Um, we went through a couple different names um, on what the pen name could be. It was a collaboration, but Vera Strange was the winner. And I love awesome. it. I love being Vera Strange. I love it even when I do events and they just call me Vera Strange. I'm like, yes, I am Vera Strange. I'm here to I always just say happy nightmares. I'm here to scare children. <laughs> well, thanks, Jen, Vera, <laughs> for thanks, coming on the back. show and talking to me about this. And I love that you're writing these stories for kids and I know my my life wouldn't be the same if I wasn't exposed to to like scary stories when I was little and in in good ways. Um, well, that's when you get hooked, and that's when you start. Yeah, saying, yeah, 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 yeah. So love you. It's so good to see your face. It's been too long. <laughs> well, one day we'll intersect again in the real world, but in the meantime, thank you to technology. Yeah, and um, say hi to the yeah. ghost. For me let me know if my grandma shows up to talk to you <laughs> i'll be like why are you bothering me i had nothing to do with it <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for joining in on this episode please go out and get the disney chill series um now she'll be a couple even a couple more books coming out amazing and all her older books uh the continuum series and uh specter book novel. yeah, yeah graphic and novel and um you can follow yeah. me on social media because i have a big announcement yeah come out in the next she, yeah months. follow yes, her on on twitter and instagram under at jennifer brody and mm-hmm. facebook is jennifer brody writer yep. so see you all next week thank you thank you